But first, we want to go back half a century to the American South. College and graduate students all across the South were organizing sit-ins to protest segregation and other injustices. But they didn't know each other, and a key leader in one of the established civil rights organizations thought these students should get together to learn from and encourage each other in what was often dangerous and difficult work. So the lady, whose name was Ella Baker, organized a meeting at Shaw University in Raleigh, North Carolina. Some 300 people attended that meeting, which began 50 years ago yesterday, and from it, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC, was born. This weekend, the group is marking that half century with a gathering also at Shaw University, and we wanted to know more about it. So we've called Marion Barry. He is a member of the Washington, D.C. City Council, a former longtime mayor of that city. He was then a graduate student at Fisk University, and he was the first national chairman of SNCC. He joins us from here in Washington, D.C. Also with us is author and journalist Charles Charlie Cobb. He's a former SNCC field secretary, and he joins us from Raleigh, North Carolina. Thank you both so much for speaking with us. Thank you. Thank you. Let me ask each of you why you wanted to become a member of SNCC. Why did you go to that meeting back then, 50 years ago? Mr. Barry? Uh, in that period, everything in the South was segregated. And also after the revolutions, et cetera, and usually it's the young students that start these kind of things. So I was at Fisk University with Diane Nash and Bernard Lafayette and John Lewis, and we were talking to Reverend Lawson had started getting us together around nonviolence in 1958. We were doing a few things. So on February 1st, when the four young men sat in at A&T, we were ready in Nashville for the second Saturday we went down, about 300 of us were arrested. It was really, we knew that there was injustices, that things were not right. And so that was that movement, it was just our time had come. And uh, we had a strong movement in Nashville, there was a strong movement in Atlanta. And there was sort of an uh, informal competition between Atlanta with uh, Julian Bond and uh, Lenny King and, and that crowd. And Ella Baker, through, I mean, Dr. King, through Ella Baker, invited us to Raleigh because we were not connected. We read about each other, we hear about each other. I may know somebody, but there was no connection. And we came together to organize us. I think King had a different idea than we did. I know he did. I think Dr. King's idea was to make us the youth arm of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. But Ella Baker, working for King now, urged us and pushed us into forming our own organization. She said, you don't want to have to spend time arguing with you know these older folks whose ideas and Ideology is not in tune with where you all are. Otis Redding wrote the song and Aretha Franklin sang it. Respect, spell that R-E-S-P-E-C-T, was released in 1967 and quickly became an anthem for disenchanted lovers, bitter employees, and just about anyone who ever felt they'd been taken for granted. Respect is one of the NPR 100 most important American musical works of the 20th century. For commentator Evelyn C. White, Aretha Franklin's Respect was much more than just a catchy tune. It was a call to action. I was a 13-year-old black girl growing up in the gritty steel town of Gary, Indiana. It was 1967, the height of the civil rights movement, with racial violence raging from coast to coast. A few years earlier, my tender psyche had been shattered by the bombing of the 16th Street Church in Birmingham, Alabama, which had left four little black girls dead. As I watched the haunting television images of the church's ruins with its broken stained glass littering the streets, I wondered if racist whites would drop a bomb on me too. Then you came along and belted out respect. Suddenly, my fears and vulnerabilities as a young black girl ease. For as much as I admired Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., I longed to see a black female face speaking out for our freedom, especially after the Birmingham bombing. There was Rosa Parks, Ella Baker, and Fannie Lou Hamer, but somehow their light had been subsumed by Dr. King and the other black men who'd become the drum majors for justice. With respect... You gave black women an unprecedented voice and visibility. 
Your song spoke to the racism that needed to be vanquished in the country, and it addressed, in a way we shall overcome, never did, the sexism that needed to be conquered in the black community. By the late 1960s, black women were demanding more from relationships than the unrealistic images portrayed in songs like My Girl and How Sweet It Is to Be Loved by You. But there was no blissful fantasizing about love and respect. You gave us raw energy and down-home truth. I remember feeling a sense of triumphant elation whenever I heard you let loose with those rollicking, sock it to me, soul lips. Here's a sister who ain't taken no mess, I think to myself joyfully. You made me feel good about myself, both as a black American during a tumultuous political era and as a young girl about to discover sex. So, now it's time to confess. Twenty years ago, after a concert you gave at Radio City Music Hall in New York City, I was determined to meet you and to thank you for making me feel special. To get backstage, I told the security guard that I was Martin Luther King Jr.'s daughter, and it worked. I was immediately escorted to your dressing room. You greeted me graciously with a sisterly warmth, knowing full well, I'm sure, that I was an imposter. But you never let on. You maintain the stature and dignity befitting your justly earned title as the Queen of Soul. While I don't regret it, I would never engage in such tomfoolery today. And I want you to know that I meant no disrespect. On the contrary, when I cajoled myself backstage, I was trying to recapture the sense of pride and possibility you'd given me when I was 13 years old. I was swept up in pure emotion and motivated only by, well, that song you seared into the conscience of a nation. <laughs> ¶¶